welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. Today, I've got the honor of having Andrew Harmon on the program. Now, Andrew is the director of The Thorn. And what is The Thorn, you may ask? Well, let me tell you about The Thorn. The Thorn tells the epic story of God's love for the world and the spiritual battle for all of humanity. Often described as Cirque meets the passion of Jesus, The Thorn combines dance, martial arts, aerial acrobatics, and emotionally powerful performances witnessed by or witnessed live by one million plus for the past 25 years. The Thorn is currently touring the country in its original live stage format for the in-person experience. On the heels of its in-theaters Fathom Run, The Thorn is now gearing up for a special virtual cinema event as an excellent way to celebrate the Easter season. Beginning March 27th, individuals and families can stream The Thorn through the virtual cinema event website, and then they can play it through various streaming platforms. So welcome, Andrew Horman. Oh, hello. I am so happy to be here. It's nice to meet you, Tony. Well, it's an honor to have the opportunity to interview you. Uh, my wife and I, we watched the movie last night, and I, I can honestly say I'm, I'm not too many things blow me away, but this blew me away. Between the, the filmography, uh, the aerial acrobatics, the acting, and the, the idea that it's on a live stage as well. So tell me a little bit about The Thorn. How did, what's the genesis of it, if you will? Uh, how did The Thorn come into existence? Sure. So The Thorn has been around for quite some time. Uh, it, the first performance of The Thorn was in 1996, so quite some time ago. Um, so this is before I was involved with it at all. And uh, it was a man named uh, John Bolin. Uh, he and his wife Sarah were uh, youth pastors uh, at a church in Colorado Springs. And um, John was looking for a way to sort of be able to portray the gospel visually to these high school kids. There was uh, one night where there was, he uh, met a girl uh, afterwards who came up, was talking to him on the stage after a sermon. And he realized that she had been sort of, sort of cutting on, on her arms as some, some teen, teenagers, you know, do sometimes when they don't know how to deal with things. And he, 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 he said to her, like, you don't have to do that because Jesus already did that for you. And he wanted to find some way to really, visually show that. And so the genesis of the idea came to him that night of how do we do sort of a big illustrated sermon of the gospel. And that's where it started. And the very first year that it, it happened in 1996, it was bad. Like it was not good. It had it had bad makeup and like just like a couple lights in the middle of the room which people would turn on and off. Like it was not not anything uh, necessarily to be proud of. But there was a genesis of an idea there. And so it sort of started to take off and they uh, put on a version of it the next spring for the entire church community. And people showed up in droves because the story of God was being told and this time a little bit better and it's grown and grown and grown. And there's been different sort of um, directors and uh, people who have shepherded the story over the last 25 years. Um, and um, so around, I want to say 2011, um, it started touring for the first time. It was just a local church show for about the first 15 years of its existence. And then in, in 2011, it started touring around the country. And uh, we would go to local churches, and it's been pretty much coast to coast. Uh, Seattle to Florida to California to Texas to Nashville. Uh, it's been pretty much everywhere. So you guys are performing in some pretty big venues, right? Yes. So this uh, this week, when y you and I are talking right now, we are in Houston, Texas right now. We're performing at the, the Hobby Center, which is uh, the, one of the biggest performing arts venues in, in Houston, Texas. And um, yeah, most of sort of the big shows were, were down in our dressing room, sort of in, in the basement. And most of the big shows from, from Broadway come through this theater. So there's a there's signatures on the wall down in the basement of this theater from Hamilton and Wicked and Phantom of the Opera from like the last 20 years. You can just go wall to wall to wall of all these shows that have come through, um, which has been a really sort of exciting thing for this this cast and crew this year as we as we travel the country uh, to sort of, you know, be in these in these public spaces alongside sort of some of these juggernauts of art. Yeah. And, and Andrew, can you speak a little bit about how uh, you've gone from a live performance, which you're still doing of the of the uh, of the thorn? How did it come about into a video, into a movie? What's the process there? 
Okay, so that um, that all happened thanks to our good friend COVID, um, which happened, uh, you know, as as we're all well aware, a couple of years ago. So um, in 2020, um, we had sort of started the next evolution of the show. We had been using sort of a lot of local volunteers um, as we were as we, we were touring, and we had sort of shifted the model. So we were trying to use all professional talent, and we we're trying to sort of take the show up to this next level, and. We got that tour on the way and it was really special. It was really good. And then two weeks into tour, you know, all of the COVID numbers exploded and public life got shut down. And, you know, we, uh, the, the Thorn had to close close up top, uh, up. Thorn had to close up shop sort of like middle of the road in the middle of the store in 2020. And uh, we didn't really know if it was going to come back when we would be able to sort of do live performances again when that would be safe it was a big a big question mark and so um in 2021 uh, we didn't tour at all and it was the first year since 1996 where the thorn hasn't performed somewhere in in the united states and it was during that time that uh john and sarah sort of sat down and said like hey like what if we could put this thing on film what if we weren't dependent on the live venue all of the time and so <clears throat> 2022, uh, we mounted sort of a short live tour and got everything in place to film this live on stage um, so that we could capture the experience that people have been crafting for the last 25 years. And so sort of for the 25th anniversary of The Thorn, we filmed it in Denver, Colorado uh, over a week's time and got the whole thing on film. You know, watching the movie um, with, with the cameras being it's it's almost like the cameras are, and I guess they are right up on stage. So when you're watching the movie, it's as if you are in the performance. Yeah, that's one of the really special things about the movie that we love. When you go and see something live in a room, there's almost no way to capture that energy, right, that you feel watching a live event. But you're you are always sort of in the audience watching it up, up on the, the, uh, up on the stage. And the Thorn has always been sort of an experiential experience to begin with. We've oftentimes put characters entering from the aisles and people carrying torches, walking in and around the audience and things like that. And so we thought, okay, what if we could get the cameras up on stage and film this so that we have much a much closer experience of the emotion and the action for the audience who's watching it as a movie. So uh, that's what we did. So we filmed the show. We had three live performances that we filmed. But prior to that, we spent the entire week before then, over about four days, um, filming each scene um, as though we were performing it live. But we'd get the cameras right up there in the action and sort of choreograph the cameras in and around the actors. So then we cut all of that footage together, three shows worth of live footage, plus all of this other sort of more directed scene by scene footage that we did during the week without an audience with the cameras super up close uh, and right in there. So it's sort of this big, broad experience. Well, it, it's amazing to me. And, and you've got a, a it seems like a huge cast. You've got a lot of performers, very talented individuals. And I, I, I imagine a lot of stagehands, a lot of. Uh, a lot of things going on behind the scenes, but talk. Give me some numbers. How many? How many folks in general uh, does it take to put a Thorn performance together and, and pull it off? Yeah. So it over the years, countless numbers of people have been a part of giving their like their whole seasons of their life uh, to this show to really bring it about and make it happen. Um, right now, on the tour itself, we have a touring crew of about fifty people. Um, a little less than 20 of those people are sort of a uh, crew. So it's, uh, the, you know, the people that hang and run the lights, um, tour managers, production managers, road managers, stage managers, those kind of people. Um, and then we have a cast of 32 people that includes two kids um, that uh, travel with us on the road right now. So the overall numbers are uh, sort of around, around 20. And that is actually small for this uh, show. We've actually tried to hone it down uh, to, to being sort of travel-sized. And 50 right now is that, is that number. Um, when we were uh, doing sort of more l local residency sh uh, shows, um, especially back in Colorado Springs, um, we could have casts upwards of 500 people, which is absolutely insane. Um, and uh, but it was it was this whole sort of immersive experience uh, with the huge crowds all reacting to miracles and all all of that. So the, the the show itself has sort of shifted and evolved over the years in, in order to tailor to sort of the experience that we are um, we are giving. So the filmed 
version has about uh, 35 main cast members and then an additional probably 30 sort of ensemble members. So it's about a cast of 60 that you're going to see in the in the film version. Wow. Again, it, it's amazing that, again, folks that are listening or watching, you've got to see the movie, but I also, and you've got some tour dates coming up as well, and I'll, I'll get into that in just a minute. I encourage you to go see it if you can. But Andrew, how did you become involved in this project? Yeah, that is that is a great question. So um, I uh, was actually in the show I was uh, when I was a teenager. So when I was 19, uh, I got the pleasure of being in the show. Uh, I played one of the disciples. I played uh, sort of young John the Beloved. Um, and it was a sort of life-changing experience for me. That was back in 2007. Um, I was an intern at the church, and then I went off to college, and then I got a job in marketing and went on with my life. Um, but in 2013, um, I was still connected with, with John and Sarah. Um, they were sort of... Uh, distant mentors and friends of mine, and we had been in conversation. And uh, I reached out to them and I was looking for a change of pace. I needed something new. And so um, I had been doing a lot of directing and uh, creative work and gotten a degree in film production. And so they hired me on staff as just sort of uh, an executive producer assistant. Um, I was John Bolin's assistant sort of for the first year and um, started uh, sort of assistant directing and pretty, pretty quickly um, started sharing directorial responsibilities with a man named Rob Stennett, who sort of pioneered how this show works and um, how it all comes about. And he and I sort of co-directed this show. Sometimes we'd have two tours going at once um, for about the last 10 years. And over the last five years, I've sort of uh, taken the reins and um, been sort of molding this towards this sort of live stage experience that we now see in these uh, theatrical venues down here in this area of the country. Well, again, truly amazing work that that you are doing and, and the others behind the scenes as well. But I, I'm curious, Andrew, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of rehearsals, a lot of traveling together. Um, and I'm always curious about this. I, um, do, do a group like the Thorn, do you become one big family uh, over time because you're spending so much time together? Yes, you sort of come become one big family or else it's all going to fall apart. Um, so uh, th th that is a, a thing with with this cast for sure. And it's something that we're actually very intentional about as sort of the production staff of, of this show. Um, we have a lot of performers now who, in, in fact, most of the cast that is touring with us right now, um, live performance is their primary profession. And so they're coming from all over the country, from New York and Orlando, Florida and Los Angeles and sort of all all corners. And one of the things that performers experience a lot on, on sort of gigs and contracts is that it's always competitive, right? You're always fighting to prove that you're good enough. You're always fighting to like find your place um, and to make sure that you stand out so that you can get the next job. Um, and it can be sort of a, um, a not very communal industry, um, depending on the community that you're in. Um, the entertainment industry overall is, um, I don't want to call it cutthroat, but it can be. And it, it can it can be um, not necessarily a, uh, um, a life-giving place. And so that's something that we're very intentional about with The Thorn is that this is a place where people who are doing this with their lives, who God has given sort of these gifts to of, you know, the ability to sing and dance and do flips and do acrobatics and act and do all these things. That this is a place where they can come and they can be supported and where we're not competitive with one another and where we're all honoring one another's like talents and trying to raise the bar for one another. And it can be, you know, a place where really good relationships uh, form and people can kind of uh, heal if they need to and then go back out into the entertainment in in industry and sort of keep keep crushing it and doing what they're what they're doing. But we, we want this to be a show where um, they don't feel that sort of uh, that edge that you always feel to have to be good enough, have to have to fight for my place that you are good enough, you do have a place here. And I think because of that energy, the show comes alive even more in, in our theaters. Well, it, that's definitely evident, evident by watching uh, the movie. Uh, speaking of the performers and the actors, how, how do you, I'm just curious, how do you go about seeking out uh, the, the, the right performer or actor for these positions? 
Yeah. So um, through all kinds of ways, I'm um, trying trying to cast uh, Jesus, the son of God um, is is rough. I don't know. It's a uh, it's a little hard um, trying to find someone who you think can adequately play uh, Satan. Uh, you know, you don't just pull that name out of a, out of a hat. Um, but the 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 thing that we're looking for is one people who have a heart to tell the story and who are um, sort of emotionally engaged for what it is that we want to do. Um, and then also for, for people that just have very specific talent sets. Um, aerial acrobatics is something that we feature pretty heavily in, in the show. And it's not, there's not a ton of people that do that. Um, we feature a lot of different styles of dance from sort of ballet to more modern, modern dancing. And we're looking for dancers who are super versatile. And so we um, have, have postings on a lot of like just normal audition website where you would see the auditions for any other traveling Broadway show. Um, but then we also sort of seek people out and find, find these people. Um, there's whole communities of like trickers, which are sort of like martial artists, acrobat guys. Um, and um, they're not necessarily, some of these guys have never performed live on stage in a theatrical show before, but they have a very specific skill set. And so some of this is like, we'll find people online who have a huge like Instagram following because they're a great tricker. And we say like, hey, uh, you also seem to love Jesus. Uh, there's this thing. Uh, would you be interested in being a part of it. And we've been doing that for years and sort of assembling this team of sort of like New York dancers and, you know, Instagram trickers. And, uh, you know, um, one of uh, our uh, actors this year who's playing the role of Jesus was um, a soccer player who uh, became a model recently and is going into acting. But his his love for Jesus and his um, he's perfect for the role. And so Again, that sounds sort of mishmash and sort of crazy and sort of a weird way to cast a show, but it's it's about finding the right person to do the thing. And so with all of these different talents and skill sets that we use in this production to tell the story, we're bringing in people from all over the place and you sort of have to hunt them down sometimes. Um, but yeah, uh, we sort of assemble this really eclectic team of, of people and something really special gets put on stage after that. Well, really special is, is certainly the term that can be used. You've got some good talent scouts, I guess, uh, to find these individuals. But, but Andrew, what, what type of feedback are you getting from the live audiences? Do you get a, do you get a chance to interact with the, the folks that are viewing? Yes. Um, a lot of the times uh, in the in the lobby, you know, there's just a huge, a huge buzz afterwards. And um, some, sometimes uh, the cast will sort of go out in the lobby and inter interact with people on, on certain nights. And the thing that we hear time after time after time is just sort of how surprised people are by what they experience. I think there is a certain expectation that you walk into a theater with when you know that you're about to see like a show about Jesus. There's just kind of like a, OK, this is the thing I think I'm going to get right. Like you sort of have a, a set of expectations and um, it's not necessarily our goal to break all those expectations expectations and blow them out of the water, but it is what we end up doing. And um, we we want to be able to tell this story in, in a way that is exciting and is thrilling and is emotional in the same way that you would respond to sort of any other show that you would see in a big theatrical venue like this. And so I, I th we, audiences are definitely feeling that the smiles on people's faces, um, sometimes the tears in the eyes during the crucifixion scenes um, in several of these venues in Texas over the last several weeks. We've had people before the show is even over during the final number, just like standing up and cheering as the show is ending, which like it's not even over yet. And people are like uh, sort of going up almost like almost like a sporting event. Um, so it, it's been really, really interesting and really, uh, I would say, uh, rewarding to see people um, emotionally responding to this this story of Jesus and how this portrayal connects with them and affects them. Well, it, it certainly affects me watching it. One of the, and there are many memorable scenes in the movie, but just a couple that stand out is the interaction between uh, Jesus and his mother uh, when he was being crucified. And another, another interaction is, is, is almost sacrilegious to say this, but the actor who played uh, Satan 
did a tremendous job uh, as well. Uh, so, yeah, powerful, powerful emotional scenes. And I, I think maybe, and I, I'm not a cinematographer, uh, or I, I just watch movies, um, but having the camera right up on stage, you could really gauge the, the emotion and the faces of the actors. Absolutely. That, that is something with, uh, with the movie that we were really excited about being able, able to do is get the camera right in there and sort of be able to read some of those more subtle um, character interactions between, between people. Something that you and I haven't talked about at all in this, but is that this show, which is crazy, but this show, no one speaks in this show except for one character. Um, there's just um, a narrator who um, sort of... Uh, s- speak throughout the show and everything else is sort of uh, set set to music, whether it's a, a dance number or a fight scene or a stunt scene or aerial acrobatics, or just watching Jesus do do miracles. It's all set to this sort of beautiful score. Um, so that makes all of those little facial interactions and those em- emotional connections that people have on stage even more important. And so I think with the filmed version, you really do get something really special when, um, you know, you're being able to see, see those looks between characters and all of that. And I love the you talk about the narrator, John, the beloved and, and, the, and the, the child actor. Speak about those guys a little bit. Absolutely. So that whole portion of the film, um, it had a really interesting genesis. So in the stage show itself, um, like I, I sort of just said, there's one character who speaks and his name is John the Beloved. And he's sort of the narrator of the story. Um, and in the stage show, he's um, he speaks directly to the audience. So in between certain scenes, because there aren't, isn't, isn't dialogue in the, in the rest of the show, he'll come out on stage and he'll talk to the audience directly and he sort of jokes around with them. And it's this really sort of fun, affable, f- familial experience with the last living disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, but it, it's, it's a really great way that sort of connects with the audience and brings them in to uh, the story by speaking directly with them. So that's how we recorded the movie to begin with. We filmed all those scenes, we filmed the audience, we filmed all those reactions, and when we cut it together, we said, this doesn't translate. This just doesn't work in the same way that it does in the room. It feels flat. It's not It's not sort of what the experience that people are having in the room is not the experience that people are going to have when they watch the movie. And so we have to somehow find a different way to capture that. So what you were talking about is these scenes with John the Beloved and this child. So what we did is we took all of those monologues that are normally scenes between John and the audience, and we went and we reshot them and rewrote them as these scenes between John and this young slave child named Asher who wanders into his cave and gives someone John to tell the story to. And we actually went out to uh, out to L.A. and um, we uh, were in a, uh, a soundstage in Hollywood for um, about half a week. And we filmed um, all of these uh, scenes with these two characters as John tells this young boy the story of Jesus and the story at a point in his life where he really needs to hear it um, to sort of try and bring the audience in through this little child. Um, and it was a whole new way of looking at the thorn. Uh, we, we hadn't done that uh, b- before or had that storytelling element um, as a part of it. And we were, we were really proud of the way that it turned out and sort of the new uh, heartstrings that it that it pulls. Well, it, it definitely pulls a lot of heartstrings. And uh, again, I, I'm going to keep harping back on this, but the talent involved and just just a question because you're involved that, that really relates to this is. As believers, as followers of Christ, uh, how important do you think it's, it, it is to be proficient in your field, whatever that field may be, an artist, a plumber, um, a, a movie maker, to, 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 per, to make the best product possible? Uh, do you think that's attractive to the, to the unchurched and, and maybe having a great product um, can bring people in to then, to then present the gospel? Maybe that didn't make sense about it. I'm tongue tied today, but I think you get my gist. How important is it to be great, to be the top of our field as believers? Right. I mean, I think I think it would be in- incredibly odd if I said it's not important at all. Um, but no, I think it's incredibly important. I, I, I think there's there's sort of two aspects of this. And um, John Boland and I, the creator and producer of, of the show, talk about this all the time, of this idea of like, 500 years ago, Christian artists were like the best artists in the world, right? Renaissance painters that like painted for the church were like 
on the cutting edge of like artistic expression. And that has sort of fallen away recently um, in maybe the past hundred ish years um, in, in, in which um, it feels like we're trying to catch up as believers so, so sometimes in the art that we, that we make. And so I think one thing is if God has given you a talent, as you were sort of alluding to there, um, it is an act of worship to use that talent well. And to use that talent in a way that glorifies him as well as is edifying to other people in a way that encourages other people and inspires them and shows them love. So if you have a talent for for dancing or acting or directing or writing or singing or any of these things, it's it's important to to not just, you know, do it halfway and say, well, it's Jesus' story. He'll he'll pick up the rest of the slack. It'll be fine. Um so I think I think there is that is is that it is it is honoring um, of the talents that God God gave us for us to work hard and hone them and try to use them as best as we possibly can. I also think you're saying about like other people who maybe aren't believers seeing something um, when you see a piece of art regardless of what your belief system is that is wonderful and beautiful, I think there is a level of respect that you have for that thing. You even if you don't. Uh, even if you don't understand it. Like I know for a lot of my life, I was like, I don't get Picasso. Like that's weird looking art, but I know it's great. Like it's really weird, but like, I don't get it, but I am going to stare at it for a while because it's good, even though I don't understand it. Um, and I think there is for people who don't necessarily hold a Christian worldview, um, or, you know, no, no Jesus or care about that. If you put together a story or a, a movie that isn't interesting to watch, it isn't emotionally compelling. There's no reason for them to stick around and stare at it. Right. Um, but if you can put together something that they might not fully like, it isn't a part of their backgrounds. So they're not relating to it on a personal level, but they are relating to it on a human level, on a, on a story level. Um, that the art they're watching is beautiful and impressive and um, then they'll lean in regardless. And that's not like a trick. That's just like, if we're going to tell this story, then it should be for everyone and let's tell it as best as, as we, we can and not cut corners. Well, there were certainly no corners cut in the, the video production of this. And I, and I'm certain I, I, and I would love to see the, the live performance as, as well. Uh, but Andrew, wh- just your own your own focus here. Uh, what do you want to see happen from the 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 thorn? What do, how do you want it to affect people's lives? The thing that we have sort of said from the beginning with this show is that the point of this show is to sort of awaken or reawaken people uh, people's hearts really to the reality of God's love. Um, and that is from, you know, watching him love people on stage to then actually watching his crucifixion and death and saying, this is the reality of what that was. This is the amount that God went through to sort of prove that he loves you beyond all, all rationale. And so having people walk away and sort of being reawakened to that or awakened to that for the first time, having that emotional, like fire reignited. I think that's the best sort of possible takeaway that anyone could have from this, from this show. And I think it's certainly what we're, we're going for. (laughs) And, um, everything that we do from the beautiful scenes to the sort of, uh, intense, scarier scenes to the really emotionally intense, you know, crucifixion scenes, all of those things we want to be sort of pointing people in that, in that direction of like, God created a beautiful world. He created you beautifully and he loves you this much. This is the amount that he went through to show that you're his child and that he loves you. Um, and if people could walk out of the theater feeling that, then that's what we want. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a pretty good want there. And it's, it's a pretty good truth. So, so certainly thank you for that. Uh, so uh, there are two venues, basically a virtual cinema event for the thorn and also seeing it live. So let's talk about the virtual cinema event. I think it begins March uh, 27 of 27th, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. So talk to me a little bit about the virtual cinema event. Yeah, that's correct. So um, at the beginning of March, we had a real cinema event in theaters around the country uh, with Fathom, where people went to movie theaters and watched this thing. About 50,000 people went out to movie theaters and watched this movie in theaters, which was amazing. And but we want everyone else to still have a chance to see this thing. And so for uh, like Ho- Holy Week, uh, the week before Easter, I, I, I believe you said uh, starting uh, March 20. Er, yeah, March 27. Um, um, w- what we have is called a virtual cinema 
event, which is where you can purchase a ticket to basically uh, rent and watch this with your family. Um, it'll be streaming uh, through a streaming service that you can access through the, the thorn.com. Um, and you can basically buy a ticket to watch certain nights. So it's virtual cinema. Um, it's sort of like uh, maybe like the old pay-per-view model a little bit, uh, but it's streaming directly to whatever device you, you want to use. Um, and so you can buy a ticket, have a bunch of friends over, watch this thing for just like one, one flat rate. Very cool. And I'll put the link to the website below the video so folks can check it out and they, they can uh, actually see it as well. But you, yeah, you're you on tour right now with the Thorn. What are some upcoming performances? How can how can folks come and see you live? What cities are you going to? Yes. So, yeah, so we're sort of touring through the s southern area of the country right now. So um, we are in Houston, Texas right now. Um, by the time this comes out, we'll probably no longer be in Houston, Texas. <laughs> but we're going to uh, Tulsa um, and then Birmingham, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And then we'll be in both Tampa and Miami, Florida. So if you're anywhere sort of around there. Tulsa, Birmingham, Charleston, Tampa, or Miami. Um, those are the rest of our tour dates uh, for the year. We're about halfway through the tour right now. We started up in Colorado, then went all through Texas, and then are sort of headed across the, the, the Gulf Coast. Well, again, I'll put the link to the website, and you can check out all of those tour dates as, as well as how more information about how to see the, the, uh, the movie as well. But Andrew Harmon, uh, it, it's been a pleasure, man, that, to speak to you. And, and again, uh, we were blown away by watching uh, the movie last night. Uh, and I just encourage folks, um, go to the website, check it out, watch the movie. And if you can, go to these live performances. I, I don't think you're going to regret it. We've certainly been blessed by watching it. Um, so, Andrew, thank you so much for, for coming on the program. I'm going to ask you to hang on just 30 seconds post-interview if you would. But thank you. Thank you. And until next time.